uh, welcome back. Um, I hope you've had a chance to see some of the previous videos where we have uh, discussed um, many of the basic ideas behind perturbation theory um, using a very simple quadratic equation as our model, a conceptual model to work out these ideas. Um, so, um, so uh, I mean, uh, again, the, uh, the 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 main motivation behind working with the quadratic equa equation so much is that it really brings out all the essential ideas, with, with, uh, and and we can actually go back and check it with the exact solutions whether uh, our perturbative solutions matches with the exact solution in these cases. But of course, these ideas are extendable to higher order algebraic equations. Uh, in the same way, so for instance, a singular perturbation problem would have the small parameter mul multiplying uh, the highest degree term typically in, a, in, a, in, a, in any, any higher order uh, algebraic equation. Um, but, but for now, let's sort of turn our attention towards uh, ordinary differential equations. And here again, we'll see that the way we, we identify different regimes of perturbation theory or different uh, like the singular perturbation, regular perturbation, uh, working with the quadratic equation. Uh, we were able to do the same with ordinary differential equations and actually the, our study of the quadratic equation will help us understand even linear second order differential equations for instance. Um, so, so let's get started with that and see how that comes about. Um, so here, um, here we have like uh, two copies of exactly the same differential equation. Um, so in this case we have a second order linear differential equation in, uh, written in terms of this variable y. So y is the dependent variable, it depends upon the variable x. So we have a term d2y dx squared which is the second derivative plus 2 times a small parameter epsilon dy dx plus y equals 0. Uh, we'll take x to be a spatial variable uh, which goes from 0 to 1 for instance and the boundary conditions are that y at x equal to 0 is 0 and y at x equals to 1 is 1. Um, <clears throat> On the right hand side, we have the same equation except that the small parameter instead of multiplying dy dx is actually multiplying the term with the highest derivative. So we have epsilon d2y dx square plus 2 dy dx plus y equals 0. Spatial extent is the same 0 to 1 and the similar boundary conditions. Um, so uh, just, just one point uh, regarding the differential equation itself. Uh, we are not um, worried so much about how this differential equation comes about. And in particular, given a physical problem, it's not uh, obvious how to write a differential equation in a way that brings out the small parameter in the problem. Um, for instance, in this case, we are assuming that x and y and epsilon are all non-dimensional. So we haven't written any units that x, we're just saying x goes from 0 to 1 in some units, which we are, we are not specifying, so, uh, which we have sort of scaled out in a way. And we've scaled, so in fact, the same differential equation um, with a small parameter appearing at different places could arise in the same uh, physical problem um, if we sort of start considering different parameter regimes of that problem. So, uh, but again, we, we're not worried too much about that for now. And um, um, so, so, so let's see uh, how how to use perturbation theory to study these different and what's the difference between these left and the, the equation written on the left hand side and the one written, written on the right hand side and how one can actually use perturbation theory to study such problems. Um, and again the idea behind working with a second order linear differential equation is we know exactly how to solve these so we know the exact solutions and again we'll be able to compare them with the solutions we obtained from perturbation theory. Now, um, so if you, uh, so if you recall, like just from the study of differential equations, one of the ways uh, to solve a linear differential equation of this form is to make an ansatz for the solution of the form. Um, let's say y x is so here y we are just writing y as identically equal to y function of x as e to the power of some parameter s times x. Um, so this we can make this ansatz for the solution. And the reason this works is because um, uh, because because of the property of the exponential that if you differentiate it once, you get back another exponential. Uh, if you differentiate it n times, you again get back an exponential. So the exponential is actually uh, an eigenfunction function of the differential operator. Or in other words, uh, if you differentiate d e s s e e s x uh, d x, we get s e to the power of s x. And uh, I've just written square brackets to emphasize that this is like an eigen This is like an eigenvalue equation. Uh, this is this is the linear uh, operator d dx, 
which operates on the function e to the power of sx gives us the eigenvalue s times e to the power of sx. Um, and if you repeat this process n times, we find that the eigenvalue is s to the power of n. So that's a very, very nice property of the exponential function, which is why they so, uh, arise so uh, often in, uh, in, 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 in physical systems. Um, so if we make this ansatz, then uh, the, the, the differential equation um, will look like um, the second derivative will give us an s squared plus 2 epsilon s plus the first term is just 1 and the whole um, whole of this is multiplied by e to the power of sx equals 0. Um, now x goes from 0 to 1 so it's a finite range and if you're looking for finite values of s then e to the power of sx cannot be 0. So so, in order, so, so the solutions of this equation are actually obtained by solving this ordinary, uh, this uh, uh, quadratic equation for s and then putting it back in here to obtain y. And notice that we have actually obtained a quadratic equation. So by making this ansatz, we have reduced the study of a differential equation into that of an algebraic equation. Um, now let's repeat the same process on, on the right hand side and uh, make the same ansatz that y is e to the power of sx. But this time we'll find that the, 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 uh, the equation that we get is e to the power of sx times epsilon times s square plus 2 times s plus 1 is 0. And so uh, the equation that we need to solve, the quadratic equation is epsilon x square plus 2s plus 1. Uh, but, but we can already see now uh, what is the difference between these two equations um, just by looking at the quadratic equations that we have obtained. So uh, on, the, on the right hand side in particular, uh, notice that the small parameter epsilon is multiplying the term with the highest degree s square. And as we saw in the previous examples in the previous videos, um, I'll put a link in case, um, uh, you, uh, in case uh, you haven't had a chance to see it, uh, that um, if, if, you, if, the, if the small parameter is multiplying the highest degree term, then this becomes a singular perturbation problem. Because if you get, if, if to zeroth order we get rid of this term, we'll miss out on one solution of the quadratic equation. Um, whereas the second order equation should have, second degree equation should have two solutions, uh, two roots. Whereas on the left hand side, the small parameter is multiplying the term to s. And in this case, if we get rid of this term, we still have our two basic roots. Uh, at the zeroth order perturbation theory and we will we will be able to use regular perturbation to solve for the roots of this equation um, and in fact this turns out to be quite a general feature of ordinary differential equations that if the small parameter epsilon is multiplying the term with the highest derivative the highest derivative term then typically we are dealing with a problem that has to be solved using methods from singular perturbation uh, whereas on the left hand side, we have the small parameter multiplying a term which is not the highest degree and we may be able to solve such problems using regular perturbation methods. Um, um, so, so these are strong indications like if epsilon is multiplying the highest degree that we might uh, have to, we, we might be able to obtain a solution using singular perturbation. Um, so, so, so you see how our study of quadratic equations actually carries us forward into um, understanding the different regimes of ordinary differential equations with, with uh, how to apply perturbation theory. Um, we, ca we can sort of understand this from another point of view, which is uh, what happens if, let's say, uh, so, 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 um, so, I mean, in, in the coming videos, we'll solve this problem completely using regular perturbation methods and again, then get back to this problem and solve this using uh, uh, methods that are that, that basically belong to the singular perturbation prop, uh, single perturb singular perturbation theory. But just to get an intuition of uh, what is it that's going, um, what, what will happen if we assume a naive regular perturbation and ex expansion for, uh, especially for the equation on, 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 on the right hand side here. Um, so we'll see that to zeroth order, um, if we drop this term, if you assume a naive regular perturbation expansion, then this term will drop out and we end up getting the equation to dy dx plus y equals 0. Whereas if we do the same thing on the left hand side uh, and drop the term that's multiplying the small parameter, we get the equation to 0th order d2y dx squared plus y equals 0. 
Now, uh, just on the study of ordinary differential equations, we know that the solution for this equation will be of the form yx is c1 sine of x plus c2 cosine of x, right? Whereas on the left, on the right hand side, the solution uh, will be of the form yx is uh, so dy dx can be expressed as minus y divided by 2. We can separate variables and integrate and we'll find that this is of the form uh, constant um, say c naught e to the power of minus x divided by 2. Right? Um, yeah, c, c naught uh, e to the power of minus x divided by 2. Now um, notice what happens. How do we, f so, so, so the problem is now uh, how do we find these constants even c2. Now on the left hand side, when y0 is 0, uh, we'll be able to solve for uh, the one of the constants. So y0 is 0, so we substitute 0 on for y and 0 for x. So if you substitute 0 for x, sine of 0 is 0, we find that c2 cosine 0 is 1, so c2 is 0. Whereas for the second boundary condition, y at x equals 1 is 1, so we substitute x equals 1 here, c2 is already 0, so we find c1 sine of 1 and this gives us c1 is uh, 1 divided by sine of 1 and c2 is 0. So our overall solution is simply um, we can write the overall solution as subject to these boundary conditions to the 0th order overall solution we should write 0th order here is simply sine x divided by sine of 1. So this is great, like to zeroth order, we can solve this equation and obtain the solution. But what's happening on the right hand side? Now, we have one equation, uh, one sort of uh, zeroth order solution, but it only has one constant C naught. So either we can satisfy this boundary condition or we can satisfy this boundary condition. So for instance, if we say that y zero is zero, then we'll have zero is C naught, e to the power of minus zero is zero. So that gives us C naught is zero. And this implies that y, the zeroth order solution, is actually zero everywhere. Now, the zeroth, if the zeroth order solution is zero everywhere, then it then it cannot satisfy the boundary condition y one equals one. And so, it's possible that this is still a solution in some range of x, but not But it it obviously violates the boundary condition at x equals one. So. And in fact, this is where uh, we are sort of leading uh, into the study of boundary layer formation. Um, um, but, but, but before we get there, we, we already see that given a second order differential equation, by dropping the term that contains the parameter epsilon, uh, especially in the cases where it's multiplying the highest derivative term, the zeroth order, the zeroth order um, uh, equation that we obtain is fundamentally different from the equation we started with because now it's a linear equation which has only one constant and it cannot satisfy both the boundary conditions that are necessary for a second order in second order differential equation and so this is where uh, this is why uh, the class of problems um, the, the, the class of problem on the right hand side actually belongs to a singular perturbation problem whereas on the left hand side we are able to satisfy both the boundary conditions if we drop let's say the zeroth order solution a zeroth order um, to zeroth order if we drop the term multiplying the small parameter epsilon uh, and so this we 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 we, uh, we should be able to solve using regular perturbation methods um, so uh, so 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 yeah in the next videos let's sort of work these things out in more detail and uh, uh, yeah, see you there then. Thanks.